Thank you. Good morning. Um, I want to thank Gary for inviting me. I think it was January this year that he called and said, would you come and be one of the speakers? And I, I think you took a big risk. Um, let's see if God will honor your faith. <laughs> um, most of you here will have paid your taxes. Uh, you have filed a return and you'd probably have done so grudgingly. A little less grudgingly than perhaps how you pay your tithe. Um, <laughs> and some of you here hate to, well, you love to hate the IRS. <laughs> I work for the IRS, or I work for the Ugandan Revenue Authority, which is, you know, like the IRS here. And um, I have to say God has done incredible things. Um, in that tax authority. But let me give you just a backdrop to my story. And this is just some stats on Africa that I picked on the internet, something that you can just do yourself. In 2013, Africa was the world's fastest growing continent at 5.6% a year. And GDP is expected to rise by an average of over 6% between 2013, last year, and 2023. Two, World Bank expects that most African countries will reach middle income status, which is defined as the at least $1,000 per person a year by 2025, if current growth rates continue. Four, poverty in Africa, or poverty in sub-Saharan Africa, has also declined. Um, you see a lot of pictures with kids, flies on their faces. Well, the media doesn't do us justice. An estimated 58% of people in the region were living on less than $1.2 a day around the turn of the millennium. By 2010, the poverty headcount ratio declined by almost 10% uh, points to an estimated 48% and it's still going down. However, in March last year, Africa was identified as the world's poorest inhabited continent. Why? Why is a continent that seems to be doing so well also so poor? Well, many reasons, one of which is corruption and it is a major source of slow development in Africa and making us the poorest continent in the world. My story. My story is the story of how God came into URA and changed what was one of the most corrupt public institutions in Uganda. In fact, every year Transparency International does a, a perception index and pre-2004, we would compete favorably with the police for position number one or number two uh, in that index. And I'd been in this organization for 13 years up to 20, um, 2004. And it didn't compute, it didn't make sense to me that I, who was a Christian who believed God, could change any place, could also be in an institution that was previously known as a den of thieves. Very corrupt, very inefficient, very high-handed and arrogant, and uh, really not treating the public very well. But in 2004, the job that I now hold became vacant. And I was naive enough to believe that God could change anything. A friend, some friends of mine, we'd been praying for about two years. Trusting and believing God could change this organization. We were Christians, we were in this organization, we we're all known as thieves. And for me, that was very painful. But I was also angry. Angry that um, nothing was happening. There was injustice, we were not raising enough money to fund government programs. And government programs that are so important for children 
for poor communities in Uganda. So once I got the job, and I have no training in business, my background is psychology and administration, so I kind of thought, oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> I remember one journalist asking me, everybody who has come and done this job has failed. Why do you think you will succeed? Like I said, I was naive enough to believe that once you bring God into the marketplace, he doesn't know the division between church and politics. He doesn't know the division between church and business. We are the ones who build these walls. And so I thought, okay, um, if God comes in and we pray, perhaps things will change. And I remember one pastor walking into my office. Um, we we're going through these major reforms and it was very dim. I don't feel the support of the church. I don't feel like they're there, you know, covering me. And he said, but Alan, you are anointed for what you do. Why are you looking for pulpit ministry in a tax authority said you are an anointed tax collector <laughs> and so I am proudly an anointed tax collector <laughs> so we began these reforms and we were looking at two things we must we had to have integrity and we had to be competent so <laughs> we did something which I think comes with a health check don't do this at home we decided we were going to draw a new organizational structure and we're going to ask every person in URA, 2,000 people to apply again for their jobs. That meant terminating them because this was a different organization. So I had the wonderful, enviable job of terminating everyone <laughs> and telling them, you have two months notice, reapply. The jobs are fewer, but anyone can apply. And so through a series of interviews, it took six months, we put 500 people on the street and remained a much cleaner and more competent organization. It sounds easy right now. It was frightening then. <laughs> but things like this have to be done if you are going to deal with corruption. And we were praying. It wasn't like, you know, kind of just got up and did something. We were really, really praying. Second thing, we went back to the taxpayers and said, what kind of service do you want from us? Now, remember up to this point, we were the organization that told every, people, every person what they do. And they looked at us and said, huh? What do you want? What are you up to? Well, we said, we, we want to serve you. Up to this point, all you've known is corruption, high-handedness, uh, arrests, and all, all manner of wickedness. And so we said, what can we do to serve you? So they began to tell us, well, we don't want to stand in long queues in your offices, because every 15th of the month, we have to line up to come and pay taxes to you guys. And we don't see returns. And it's very expensive. And besides, your laws, the tax laws, are mysterious. We never understand them. And you never take the trouble to talk to us. So we said, okay, um, you don't want to come, so we're going to make sure you don't have to come. So we built online systems. Said, number two, we're going to teach you. We're going to explain to you. We're going to give you your rights and obligations so that we now front tax education and people have got to know their rights before you run after them to collect from them. And so we front-loaded service and put auditing and enforcement in the back end. Then we also realized that one of the reasons why people actually don't want to pay taxes is because, why, why there is non-compliance, is because this institution that is collecting revenue has a really bad image. People don't like us. So I said, what do we need to do to get people to <laughs> like the tax collectors? <laughs> yeah, so what we, be, what we did then, <laughs> what we did was to rebrand. 
tried, we did everything that we could to cut off the old image, including our logo and our colors and our cars and everything, changed everything about us. Then we went into the public to do community work. You know, um, some areas are really poor and some schools don't have desks and textbooks. So we began to collect things and say, let's go in and show people that we are tax collectors, but we are here because you pay your taxes. And they began to trust us. And over the years, I can tell you it has taken 10 years, God has invaded the tax authority. And because he has, thank you. We've seen revenue grow. In the last 10 years, revenue has grown by 317%. Thank you. The tax revenue we collected, we used to contribute 54 to 58% to the national budget. Last year, we contributed 712 And we're going to reduce that slowly because I am convinced we are not a poor nation we have capacity issues. God has invested so much in Africa, in my country. There is so much resources. We just need to get the people to do the right thing. One of the other things that has shown me that God is doing an incredible work in Uganda Revenue Authority and what he's doing in URA, he can do anywhere. The people that we have trained that have worked with us a number of years, and that have now left the organization are heading big public institutions. Previously, nobody wanted to recruit from URA. In fact, I remember the international agencies like World Health Organization, World Bank had a policy, do not recruit from URA. <laughs> I now have a problem retaining my people. That's a, it's a good problem. <laughs> because um, we, we the people that we have trained are heading the Kampala City Authority. Some of you, I think Gary said you, you did meet the lady who, you, who heads the city authority, who's turned it completely around. She was our company secretary. The director of public prosecution was my personal assistant. <laughs> How cool is that? <laughs> we have people that have gone to, to the World Bank who are heading... Um, regional, regional uh, projects. This is not about me. It was always God's idea. It was God's idea because he didn't just want us to have a good name, but he wanted to serve the people of Uganda. He wanted the children to have a chance to go to school. He wanted medicine in the hospitals. He wanted communities developed. And this organization, this public institution, was just standing in his way uh, because just did not acknowledge God. I am so convinced that if we will invite the kingdom of God to where we are in the public areas, in business, in some churches, I believe... I believe that God will take over and will begin to see better societies. It has happened in URA, it can happen anywhere. I thank you. Well, praise the Lord, good morning. What an honor to be here at this leadership summit. I was here yesterday enjoying all the leadership, and thank you, Bill, for your friendship and this opportunity. In the year 2002, I was approached by the police commander because of an epidemic in our city of Chicago, in our community of Humble Park. They have arrested over 600 women for prostitution. And the commander of the police, imagine that, that the commander of the police came to the church. We're talking about faith in government, faith in business, here the police is coming to the church and said, Reverend De Jesus, can, is there anything you can do? And I said, absolutely, we can pray for you. <laughs> We're good for that. 
Prayer is necessary. Prayer is a weapon. Sometimes our prayer is all we can do because of distance. But we cannot allow prayer to be a crutch not to do anything. And I said, uh, I went home and told my wife, I said, babe, uh, 600 women were uh, arrested, unduplicated, and for prostitution, went to sleep. Woke up the next morning, I said, babe, I feel like God wants us to buy a farm for these women. We got to do something. And she says, well, what do you know about farming? I don't know anything. And so I, uh, I did what any pastor would do. Went to their church in the inner city of Chicago, filled with Hispanics. Got to the pulpit and I said, church, somebody here has a farm. Give it up. <laughs> That's how we do in Chicago. You got to give it up. Eight months, I set that church. I'm serious now. These women, we got to do something. And someone here has a farm. You better give it up. I don't know how you do it in your city or in your villages or towns. But on the eighth month, a lady came to me and said, Pastor Choco. And by the way, the name Choco comes from chocolate uh, as a term of endearment in the Puerto Rican culture. And she said, Pastor Choco, uh, uh, my uncle and his wife of 42 years, she just passed away three hours from Chicago. They own a farm. They heard, uh, he heard you were looking for a farm. And, and sure enough, one thing led to another. And we went to the farm and we purchased the farm. And since then, since then, 500 women have been rescued from the streets of Chicago from prostitution and human trafficking. Now, you cannot, as a pastor, as a business, as an organization, you cannot let your budget dictate your faith. You're going to have to trust God that he will meet all your needs. Because once the moral condition, once the moral condition of your community has been revealed to you, we must move to action. Amen. Amen. We just can't say, oh, that's sad. No, the Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30, I look for someone among them who will build up the wall and stand before me in the gap. The word gap here in Hebrew means Ibanayim. Ibanayim means between two places. God himself said, I look for someone among them who will fill the Ibanayim. And look what he says. And I didn't find no one. Not one man, not one woman who would be willing to fill that gap, who would stand in the gap. A gap, by definition, represents a place of weaknesses, a, a place of vulnerability and danger. Gaps exist all over our countries and in our villages and our cities. You would say, well, Pastor Choco, we've always had gaps. This is true. But today, the gaps are wider and more destructive. And that question, even God is still saying, I'm looking for somebody who will stand in the gap. And as a pastor, I decided in Chicago that I was going to engage that gap. And we as leaders, lay leaders and pastors, we must engage our community. You must engage your community, not only the 50 that come to your church, not only the 1,000 that come to your church or 200, but the entire community, you have to see it as your church. You say, well, Pastor Chogo, how do, how do I see the entire community? We must do we must do what Jesus did. He sat with the lost. He ate with the lost. He conversed with the lost. He, he sat with people who didn't look like you and I. And that's what the gospel, Jesus Christ, he went towards the Samaritan women. He went towards Zacchaeus. He went towards the demon-possessed man. One day I called one of our ladies of the church, the leader, and I said, I want you to go out and I want you to go hire me five prostitutes. She said, you want me to do what? <laughs> I said, you heard me. I want you to go out and hire me five prostitutes. We have a problem. She said, Pastor Choco. I said, just go do it. She went out, came back two or three hours later. Five women came out of her car. They were a mess. Mini skirts. They looked like they were drugged up. And then she came out to say, Pastor Choco, the one on the right says she'll charge you $50. The one over here says she'll charge you $35. And the other one here says she'll charge you $40. And in total, it was like $220. And no problem. And I went to the five women and said, here's, here's your $50. Here's your, here's your $35. Here's your $40. And one of the girls came out and said, what would you want us to do to you, sir? I said, I want you to follow me. Now, I know this is being watched around the world. 
My wife is with me through this whole time. The devil is a liar. Amen. And so I said to the five women, I said, I want you to, I want you to come with me. And here it is, pastors. Here it is. For me, what's sacred is the message, not the method. The method is not sacred for me. I'm going to throw all sorts of lines and all sorts of baits to be able to reach whoever for Jesus Christ. And so I took, I took the five women. I said, follow me, follow me. And they came in. They came into the church. And we decked it out with linen and candles and roses. And I pulled up the chair. And I said, now sit down, honey. Sit down. I said, I got you for one hour. I'm going to tell you about a man who stood in the Ibanayim, who stood in the gap for you, who loves you. And for one hour, they stood there crying tears. They stood up after the one hour and said, no one has ever treated us this way. Here's your money back, preacher. We don't want your money. To the glory of God, some of these women are involved in ministry now. Why? Because you approach them, you engage them. We must not be afraid. We must not be afraid to take our faith into the communities. Fear is the absence of faith. Reminds me of a man named Nehemiah. who's living his life, and I'm paraphrasing. He's living his life in the city of Susa and he's doing a great job. He's got a 401k plan, living large, retirement plan. And finally, at Starbucks, he sees a friend, his brother, according to the Bible, Hananiah comes to him and Nehemiah, watch this, Nehemiah asked the question that changed the course of his life. How's Jerusalem? And can I tell you something, leaders and pastors, if you're not going to do anything about the answer, then don't ask. Because it changed the trajectory of his life. Once he heard about the walls that were ruined, and they were ruined for over 140 years, Zerubbabel, he built the temple, yet the temple was exposed. Watch this. The temple was exposed. The people were vulnerable. And then Nehemiah felt like he had to do something. That a gap has been presented because with revelation comes responsibility. Once you have been revealed a problem in your city, in your country, you are moved to act. And here's what he did. I want to give you four things that Nehemiah did when he heard about the problems in Jerusalem. Number one, he prayed. The Bible says that Nehemiah began to fast and pray. God gave him a strong burden. Nehemiah began to weep for his people. He began to cry for the hopelessness. Oh, God, move us. To weep for our cities. One billion people can't write or read in this world. God, move us to pray for them. 80% of the world population lives on $10 a day. There's a gap, my friends. One of three people in the planet lack water. There's a gap. And he prayed from Susa for a few months. Prayer is good, but it has to move us to do something. Number two. The Bible says that he planned. Now, planning is crucial, leaders and pastors. you got to write it down. Planning is part of the process. And many of us here like the final product. What we don't like is the process. Oh, I love the church. Look at this big church. But it took Bill a long time. And headache and prayer and planning. Nehemiah sat down and he planned. I like, I like football, American football. American football, I like that. And, you know, they got 11 guys on one side. That's called the offense. The, the other guys, it's called defense. And, and the guys on the offense, uh, the coach is on the sideline, and, and the quarterback gets the play, and he goes in the circle, and that in the NFL is called the huddle. And they get in the huddle, and, and according to the NFL, you've got 25 seconds to call a play. And if you don't call a play within those 25 seconds, delay of game and penalize. Can you imagine if the NFL, these guards and these tackles are like, hey, let's just stay here. Let's talk about what we're going to do after the game. <laughs> and I wonder how many leaders, how many pastors have been in the huddle for five years. When is it? When is it? When, when we see a need and when we see a gap, what, when is it that we're going to call break? And do what God has called us to do and fill the gap to the glory of God. 
We got to get out of the huddle. Number three, he proceeded. Now it's time to go from Susa to Jerusalem. 766 miles to Jerusalem. An opportunity. This presents sacrifice. You got to be willing to sacrifice. I remember when I was in DR, Dominican Republic. I was in a little village and there was, a, there was a need between the village and a medical center. It was three hours distance. These people had to walk to the medical center. And I went back to Chicago and it was disturbing my heart. And I just can't sense the Lord said, hey, Choco, get two ambulances. And I was at a press conference with Mayor Daly and he was standing right next to me and I was like, ask him. <laughs> After the press conference, I said to the mayor, mayor, I need two ambulances from your fleet. Walked away. That's how we do it in Chicago. <laughs> a week later, the mayor's office called me and said, Hey, Reverend DeJesus, we've got two ambulances for you that we want to donate to you. And then after we got the two ambulances with the deeds and the title, then something hit me. Wait a minute. We're going to cross state lines. How is that going to look? Are the Puerto Ricans driving the ambulances? <laughs> no. I had to go back to the mayor. I said, Mayor, I need a letter that allows me to go through state, just like Nehemiah. Once you have been revealed the problem, you must act to fill that gap to the glory of God. Number four, the last thing he did is that he persuaded. Whenever you decide, whenever you decide to stand in the gap, you're going to face strong opposition. Hear me out, pastors and leaders. The moment you decide to stand in the gap, there will always be opposition. But God is with you. Who can be against you? To the glory of God. One of the things I notice about this story of Nehemiah is that Nehemiah, he was neither a priest, he wasn't a king, he wasn't a prophet, he was a lay person. And this is a season to release our lay people into the gaps in our cities, into the gaps in our communities, and to engage the problems that we're facing today. I want to tell you here at this leadership summit that the question that Nehemiah asked is relevant today. He asked, how is Jerusalem? That question today, 2014, how is Los Angeles? How is Missouri? How is Hong Kong? How is Georgetown? How is Australia? How is Camden, New Jersey? That question is relevant today. Regardless of where you live, there are gaps everywhere. I leave you with this. Courage. Is an inner, inner resolution to go forward despite obstacles. Cowardice is submissive surrender to circumstances. Courage breeds creativity. Cowardice represses fear and is mastered by it. Cowardice asks the question, is it safe? Expediency asks us the question, is it political? Vanity asks the question, is it popular? But conscience asks the question, is it right? And there comes a time when we must take a position that's neither safe, nor political, nor popular. But one must take it because it's right. God bless you.